Hi, welcome to True Creeps, where the stories are true and the creeps are real. We'll cover stories from grotesque gore to the possibly plausible paranormal, to horrifying history, to tense and terrible true crime, and everything else that goes bump in the night. We're your hosts, Amanda, and I'm Lindsay, and we want you to join us while we creep. We cover mature topics. Listener discretion is advised. Hey, everybody. So today we are going to be talking about Hocus Pocus. I'm very excited for this episode. Me too. And so we're talking about it this week because Hocus Pocus 2 comes out next week. We're going to talk a bit about the movie itself, some theories from the movie, and then we're going to break down some of like the historical things at play that are happening in the movie. Yeah. As well as some other stuff too. It's going to be a fun time. Also, as a note, you might hear my dog snoring. Miss Moo had surgery not too long ago and requires like constant supervision. So she is inside the podcast for it. To start, let's do a quick refresher of the movie just in case you haven't already watched it recently again. We're expecting that you'll be watching it again. I feel like everyone watches it every spooky season, and we are definitely in spooky season now. Yes, yes. Well, okay. To me, spooky season begins on August 27th, the day after my birthday. That is when summer is done. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. This is the most fun research because I was like, I'm watching Hocus Pocus. It's research for the podcast. (laughs) And I was pumped about it. So let's do a quick refresher of the movie. It follows the three Sanderson sisters, Winifred, aka Winnie, Mary, and Sarah, and They need to consume the life force of children after said children have guzzled some green potion. Don't like the way you said that. I know. You're welcome. (laughs) You're welcome. In the 1600s, they consume Emily's life force before turning her brother, Thackeray, into a black cat with an extremely long life. Immediately after, they're hanged for their crimes. And 300 years later, they're resurrected when a teenage virgin named Max lights a black flame candle. But they must consume the life force of a child before dawn or they'll die again. During this time, they're also working towards their main quest of consuming all of the life force from all of the children of Salem. But Max, his sister Danny, and the girl he's got a crush on, Allison, are getting in the way. They almost have some delicious virgin life force, but they are thwarted at the last minute, as often happens in movies like this. And in the kerfuffle, Thackeray, as a cat, dies and is reunited with his family. Still really sad. It's very sad. Before we talked about anything else, I'm assuming that anybody who has watched Hocus Pocus has asked themselves this question at least once. And if you caught my inflection earlier, you can bet your pippy that the question is, how common of a name is the name Thackeray? (laughs) Amanda, have you asked yourself that question? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think like as a kid, I thought it was Zachary. Mm -hmm. I did too. And then, you know, after I was like, Thackeray? Why? <laughs> for for what? And so, yeah. what does Thackeray mean? Well, of course, it means a place with thatching. And I was reading that. I was like, okay, but what the fuck is thatching? I don't know what that is. And that's when you make a building <laughs> or a roof of straw reeds. And I just can't imagine being like, and that's what I'm going to name my kid. I'm going to name my kid after a place with a building or a roof made of straw or reeds. Like, what? You know what it reminds me of? Is remember surnames a long time ago? I think it's called surnames when people were like Johnson, John's son, and stuff. Like, I wonder if like his dad was some sort of roofer and was like, he will too be a roofer. And he was like, I'm gonna name my child after my profession. Yeah, like I'm so into my profession that I'm gonna name my child after it. <laughs> yes. And the question though is, how common of a name is Thackeray? Oh no, I hope it's not common. Per everything dash birthday dot com, which is obviously <laughs> the most reputable source for baby name information. <laughs> How do you think I found my son's name? 64 baby boys have been named Thackeray since 1880 in the United States. And like, okay, 64 for a very long time. Okay, that's okay. Okay. And you're like, oh, that's going to be top heavy, right? Like it's going to start in the 1880s. Wrong. No, (sighs) it was most popular in 2016 when 10 babies were named Thackeray. And then in case you were wondering, Thackeray. (laughs) Is from the English Thackeray, because of course it is. Why not? I just needed to get that out of my system first, because that was like my first question. I was like, I need to figure out the answer to this. You know what? I'm wondering if that's when Halloween became more popular again, because I don't know if you've noticed like the spike in like Halloween things being more places. I've always been into Halloween, obviously. But like, I don't remember years ago being able to walk into almost any store and buy Halloween goods from like August 
through October until the last few years. I think that there was a, like, a cultural coming together. A meeting. Of women being like, we fucking like spooky stuff. All of us. So, okay, not all of us. Some people really like fucking Christmas. But a lot of women are like, fuck yeah, Halloween. And it's not just spooky gals. People who don't consider themselves spooky or goth or anything like that who are like blonde pumpkin spice latte, like living their life. You don't have to be blonde to pumpkin spice latte. Just saying. Look, I'm a pumpkin spice latte. I celebrated the day that every coffee shop in my area had pumpkin spice back and I had to go immediately. And also, I will tell you, I also am an apple cider girly. What I am at heart is a beverage woman. I'm a woman of beverages. <laughs> anyway, let's keep on chugging along. <laughs> All right. So I know Lindsay went over the plot of the movie, but let's talk a little bit about the movie itself. So it was released in 1993. And of course, the witches are Mary Winifred, or she goes by Winnie, and Sarah, per David Kushner, one of the co-writers, the story came from a scary story that he used to tell his kids. And interestingly, even though it was just a story, it was based off of historical events and certain tropes around witches. So in the movie, Max said that Halloween was invented by the candy companies. But Lindsay and I discussed this in our fifth episode, Halloween History, Myths, and Mischief. Just babes. You know that's not the case. Uh, right? So long ago. Almost 100 episodes ago. Woof. That's wild. That's wild. Yeah. But that was a really fun episode. We talked about Sawin, whether raisin cookies are an abomination, which they are for sure. They're not. <laughs> they're disgusting. They're not. <laughs> <laughs> I get the last word and they're awful. Halloween sadism. No, you don't. They're delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Root vegetable mutilation. Souling. 200 boys. Raisin cookies are good. Raisin cookies are disgusting, cabbage Raisin pranks, are... and some two true cases where bodies were mistaken for decor. The names of the Sanderson sisters are based off of real victims of the Salem witch trials, which I didn't really know until recently. It didn't occur to me, but it, like, of course they are. Right? Like, obvious. Now, not sisters, but just names of women. Yeah. Yeah. So the old Burial Hill graveyard is a real graveyard in Marblehead, Massachusetts, which is pretty close to Salem. And that's the scene where, like, Max gets his shoes taken. I actually looked up an article recently about all of the buildings in general. So all the buildings and the houses throughout the entire movie. And most of them are actual places in Salem. And all of their addresses are all over online. So you could actually do, like, a Hocus Pocus tour. Ooh, I want to go. <laughs> the sister's spellbook in the movie was a gift from Satan. And, of course, they have the uh, fake Satan, which they call Master. I love that, like, whole scene hilarious scene yeah his wife was not fucking having it she was like <laughs> who is this woman you're dancing with well that and like when mary's watching the tv the stupid commercial i thought that was a real commercial or something like it maybe it was like a mockery of a commercial back then i remember it very vaguely but i adore mary yeah yeah so the black flame candle was made out of fat of a dead man and it'll of course raise the spirits of the dead if lit by a virgin on halloween night I believe with a full moon. Just loving virgins. Like a lot of virgin discussion for a Disney movie. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to talk about it a lot today. So the Salem Witch House likely inspired the Sanderson Sisters house. And it was also featured in Ghost Adventures. So one of the things that we really wanted to look at was we looked at some of the tropes that were in the movie. One of those was, why are witches always trying to eat children? And in Hocus Pocus, they're really after the life force so that they can become immortal. But so often you hear about witches eating the young. So we were curious. Yeah. We explored why are witches and other characters always wanting to do things like eat children. In addition, we wanted to look at the trope of people wanting to take life force from children or sometimes adults and because they wanted to live forever. I think one of the things that I like about Hocus Pocus is that they don't live forever. They're just like continually resurrected. So it's not like they're living for like a thousand years. They're living for brief periods during several different time periods. Except for Thackeray. Yeah. And there's massive technology changes between the time periods. And I find that very interesting because it's one thing if you're like aging with the world, but it's different if you're just kind of blipping in for a minute and you're like, what the fuck is happening now? Because <laughs> the last time I was here, there were people named Thackeray in a little tiny village. What is happening? Right. Why are people eating children? When I hear eating children, what I think of is Hansel and Gretel because she's like, I'm going to eat you for eating my house. It's a lot wrong here. 
But that's actually not where it started. It started long before that. And the roots can actually be dated back to the high Middle Ages. And a lot of what happened during this time probably inspired Hansel and Gretel. So the high Middle Ages wasn't the greatest time for Northern Europe. And when you think not the greatest time, we mean like the Crusades had just ended and there were multiple years of famine. And they had the first wave of a little thing called the Black Death, aka the Bubonic Plague, around 1347. And these kind of horrific events happening in succession really led a lot of people to become more spiritual and superstitious. That feels kind of reasonable to me. Yeah, yeah. You've gone through just so much shit that you're like, this has to be for a reason. Look, when I hear trauma has made me incredibly superstitious, perhaps to a problematic way, which soap maker do you think of? Chinchuli. Yes. Leonardo Chinchuli, she had several different just terrible things happen to her. And so she got superstitious to the point that she started making people into soap. I can see how people can get there. I don't know if I could get there. That's good. To be like, cannibalism is a normal thing to project onto others. But during the Great Famine between 1314 to 1317, there were reports of volcanic activity in Southeast Asia and New Zealand, which created a prolonged period of climate change, which to me, fascinating. When you think climate change, you think of right now, not hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Mm -hmm. Part of this climate change led to crops failings and mass starvations. And there were lots of stories that came from this period where people were starving to death, like mothers being fed their children, people digging up graves to eat other people, people eating children out of hunger, or people selling kids they couldn't feed. Infanticide and cannibalism became more commonly talked about because of this. And during the Middle Ages, it was considered the worst crime in Europe. German women, by law, were even expected to report their pregnancies. And if they didn't and claimed to have a stillborn child, they could be executed for infanticide. And historically, only women could be charged with the crime. Boy, does it feel too incredibly fucking reminiscent now. First off, when you hear about people not having bodily autonomy and to be able to make the decision for themselves whether they will carry a baby, that to me is already kind of like horror fuel. But when you add on top of it that people are reporting other people for getting abortions and there's talk about like how do you enforce this and things like that and it's always such nightmare fuel that it's like oh are you literally just reading history books because that's what it sounds like yeah when i read this part when i was researching i was like my goodness oh this sounds very <laughs> current and then there's a lot more i tried to um you know minimize it because obviously what goes hand in hand with hocus pocus but like there's so many parallels and it's frightening so, with all of this horribleness, let's add some witches into it. In 1486, a legal and theological document was written by Johann Sprenger and Heinrich Kramer, and it was called Malleus Maleficarum, and it's Latin for Hammer of Witches. The malice was split up into three different parts and focused on the implementation of Exodus 2218. It sounds like a metal band, by the way, just the name of that. It totally does. Totally does. But... It was, you shall not permit a sorceress to live. Oof. Yeah. So part one is where the reality and the depravity of witches is emphasized, and any disbelief in demonology is condemned as heresy. This also allowed for any witness, no matter their credentials, to testify against an accused. This can't be good. No, <laughs> it was not good. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like our occult specialists that we talked about in our Satanic Panic episodes, where they're like, I know things about evil. <laughs> and they'll have like PhDs where they never attended a class. Yeah, exa that's exactly what I thought of. Part two reviews the stories and the activities of witches. And these were crazy. One blog translated some of these stories. And it included things like them preying on babies, especially when they weren't yet baptized. Also, stealing babies to boil them in a cauldron until the flesh is made almost drinkable. That's very specific. It gets worse. The more solid parts are then made into a paste, quote, suitable for our desires and arts and movements by flight. So I'll help them do all of this. I don't like the idea of a paste. No, no, no. It gets, it gets worse. Then the, the runny liquid was put into a container and whoever drinks it is, quote, immediately rendered knowledgeable when a few ceremonies are added and becomes the master of our sect. Can I just ask a question just i'm not saying that this is real because this sounds 
insane to me. But if you were going to boil a human so that you could eventually separate the runny liquid from the paste and you wanted that liquid to make you more knowledgeable, wouldn't it make sense to boil a human with knowledge? Not a baby. Probably. Right. I mean, I'm just saying, like, if we're writing fiction, let's at least write good fiction. <laughs> well, part three discussed the legal procedures to be followed in witch trials. So this, this abomination was a thing. It went through 28 editions between 1486 and 1600, and it was accepted by Roman Catholics and Protestants as an authoritative source of information concerning Satanism and as a guide to Christian defense. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> also, to throw a fairy tale monster in the mix, because why not? By the way, this also means that the satanic panic isn't from uh, the 70s and 80s. It means started <laughs> in the 1300s and it's just stayed strong that fucking long. Yeah, it just like pops up here and there where it's like rebranded. Yeah, yeah. That's a good way to think of it. QAnon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So because we love monsters right like we go crazy over this i wanted to throw a fairy tale monster into the mix here there's a classic german monster called the kindly fresser hopefully i said that right or child eater classic classic <laughs> it's pretty much the german boogeyman from what i understand it's an ogre it carries a bag of kidnapped babies <laughs> to eat <laughs> It carries a bag of babies. <laughs> it reminds it's me of a Christmas ridiculous. monster. It does. It does. It's real Krampusy. Mm. It is. It is. So in German lore, witches were the female equivalent of this creature. Do they have a cool name or nah? I don't think so. You know, just women. Yeah. Ugh, women. <laughs> <laughs> also, there is a fucking fountain sculpture of this thing in Switzerland. Now, Lindsay, I need you to see a picture of this. I have it prepared for you. If you would scroll to the hidden page in our outline, please. Fantastic. Fantastic. Obviously, Amanda did this part of our research. Otherwise, she wouldn't have a surprise photo for me. Okay. I'm, I'm scrolling to page 32. Oh. What do you think? Oh. Okay. Hold on. Wait. I'm, I'm going to make this big as hell. <laughs> so the statue itself, it looks kind of manlike, right? Like a creature eating a baby while having three other children in his bag. If you want a very intense description, stick around until after our, our outro where the long version of me describing it is because it was honestly too long. But also, I feel like you need a visual. I want, I want you to hear this description before you see the picture. <laughs> there is a lot of questions around this fountain. And it was built in 1546, and it's one of the oldest fountains in the city of Bern. As you described, yeah, he's eating babies. He has them in his bag. There are so many theories, and a lot of people are confused, too. But there are a lot of theories. Some are not so great of what it represents and why it exists. But most of them are like, it's, you know, this, this German monster. I've seen some saying that it's like Krampus. There's so many. It was interesting. But just the fact that, yeah, that's... The German monster, they equate it to witches, and it exists as a fountain. So we're going to talk about the Salem witch trials more, but there were trials. There were witch trials before that, and there was at least one that included eating children. So a group of three women were brought to trial after the testimony of a woman named Grace Sorabutz in 1612. And these are known as the Samsbury Witches of Lancashire, England. And so Grace, the accuser, was 14, and she accused her grandmother, Jeanette Beerley, her aunt, Ellen Beerley, and a recently widowed woman named Jane Southworth. And she had many an accusation, including that she had been abducted multiple times by them, that her grandmother, you know, casually transformed into a dog and tried to force her to drown herself, as dogs are known to do. What else do grandparents do? Typical grandmother behavior. And then she was like, and then, you know, the time her aunt and her grandmother stole a child from its parents' bed, they drove a nail into its navel and sucked its blood. Fucking yikes. Mm -hmm. So obviously the baby died and they buried it. Then a few days later, they dug it up and then cooked and ate the body and then rendered down what remained. This allowed them to change shape. And these are only a few of her accusations, by the way. So luckily, Jeanette, Ellen, and Jane were allowed to speak, and they begged Grace to tell the court who it was that set her on to make these accusations. Because these are like really big fucking accusations. And they're also, they're wild, so heinous that they don't sound real. 
and not to continue to call other cases, but we recently talked about the Fall River cult murders. And there's a story about one of the murders that is just so over the top that it doesn't sound like it could be real. And this feels like that. So initial questioning revealed that Grace was unable to add anything in her own words. So she basically was just saying things that she had been coached to say in a certain way. And the judge told the court that it was obvious to him that someone had coached Grace. After Grace was interrogated, she recanted her testimony and admitted that Christopher Southworth, a Jesuit, told her what to say. And Jesuit is a member of the Society of Jesus, a religious order of the Catholic Church. And annoyingly and disgustingly, Christopher was actually Jane's uncle. And luckily, the women were acquitted. Wild. Yikes, though. Yikes. So, yeah, we answered our first question. Why are we eating babies? Why do we think this? The 1300s fucking sucked period that's why it started with rumors about people in general and then it spread to people who we are going to accuse of heresy we're going to lump them in with these accusations of they're cannibals they kill babies because it's the worst thing they can think of because in that time period that was the worst thing that people thought could happen so now we're moving on to why is everybody eating fucking life force so when you think about life force and youth they're kind of similar, right? Because like, and I feel like generally when you see movies where they're taking someone's life force, they're doing it for youth and for eternal life. Yeah, it's kind of a pair. So one of the most well-known legends is the Fountain of Youth. And one of the earliest accounts comes from a Greek historian, Herodotus, from the 5th century BC. He wrote of the Fountain of Youth in the land of Macrobians, which gave the people of the region exceptionally long lifespans. And next, Alexander Great searched for the Fountain of Youth in the 4th century BC. And many people have searched for this fountain or some remedy to stop aging. And legends included the fountain, but also things like rivers and springs and other water sources that could reverse the aging process or do things like cure sickness. And that makes me think of uh, Talk Everlasting, which I was like, I read the book when I was a kid. And like, I remember seeing Alexis Bledel from Gilmore Girls. She was in the movie. And I feel like that's what it makes me think of. <laughs> I think of that. Oh, then I also just like the life force thing. As a kid, I was very big Sailor Moon fan. And... A lot of that comes up again. So I was like, oh, it's like Sailor Moon. So I went to law school in Jacksonville, which is where I met my husband. And we would go to St. Augustine pretty regularly because we loved visiting there. And he had been going there since he was a kid and going to some of the tourist attractions with his family. And one of the times we were there, we went to a place called the Fountain of Youth. And it was a... Uh, a fountain that was basically discovered by Ponce de Leon, and he said that there was healing waters that would, like, help you maintain your youthful appearance. To me, what's most interesting about that place is not necessarily that, but the fucking peacocks just wandering around. Loose peacocks. We have a park like that here. Never had I seen that before. They were beautiful. <laughs> and I've never seen the way that they, like, vibrate their tail feathers. Mm -hmm. So funny to me. But, okay, life force is also seen in other ways. You think of it in, like, vampires, right? Look, we're calling back every fucking episode today. <laughs> Elizabeth Bathory, discussions where we talked about blood being associated with youth and perhaps being able to keep you youthful looking if you were to bathe in it. And in that episode, we even talked about that there was a company doing treatments with youth blood and plasma. I looked it up again, and it still has a website, so it still exists. Yeah. I feel like with all of that history and then mix it together... That's all the tropes that you see in movies with witches, right? In books and things like that. Yes. So a little bit to go back into the movie and the actress playing one of the witches, Sarah Jessica Parker, she had an appearance on an episode of Who Do You Think You Are in 2010. And she realized that one of her great grandmothers had faced witchcraft accusations 10 generations back. Her name was Esther and she was from Gloucester and she was arrested in the 1690s with two other women. So what happened is a woman named Mary got ill and a 17 year old said Esther and two other women had been choking her while they were in specter form. Mm -hmm. Interesting. The woman ended up dying. So they arrested the three women. The local government ended their witch trials before Esther was tried and Esther did get to live until she was 82. And we'll talk more about that specter form and the idea that it seems like people thought that witches could do astral projection. Yeah, there's a lot of people that think many different people and cultures and a lot of people can astral project. So that's interesting. So another trope that we see in this movie is like the importance of a virgin. 
and kind of like how it relates to like supernatural things and beings. So we found a couple different reasons and different information around this. And one interesting view is that the connection of purity and virginity stems from religious beliefs. And then what was added was the idea of witchcraft. And then they started, you know, of course, the witches were going after something precious to them, which we've kind of already talked about, like anything that they thought was of importance at all. They're like, well, the witches want to go after it, right? Yeah. So throughout many religious doctrines, one's virginity is a way of honoring their relationship to God. So sacrificing this individual's blood seems like it would be, you know, more valuable in a sense. Okay. Or I thought of more like, it's a big like, fuck you. Because like, if they have like the biggest relationship with God, it's like taking away one of like, I don't know the better way to say it, like favorites, right? <laughs> like Sky Daddy's up in the sky and he's got this book and it's like people who did the nasty. <laughs> And that's like least favorite. Mm -hmm. And then it's like virgins. And he's like favesies. Like that's how that works. Okay. Okay. I was making sure I understood it. <laughs> that's what I saw. That's what I understood it as. So also virgins played a central role in many areas, including mythology. So there are several gods that were known as virgins. Another role was in later Roman society with the Vestal Virgins. I kind of got into this a little bit because I thought it was fascinating. But they were the empire's most important citizens, and they kept the sacred fire in the Temple of Vesta. They took an oath of virginity, and they were supposed to keep it while they served 30 years in this temple. But at the end of like their 30 years, they were allowed to like marry if they wanted to, but a lot of them ended up staying. So these particular virgins had more privileges than a married or single woman in the area had. They were able to do things like have the ability to handle their own property, whereas others weren't allowed to. I think that maybe that's why a lot of them ended up staying after their, like, I don't know, term was over. Oh, gosh. But they also had very strict rules, and there were very harsh punishments given if they did not follow all of these rules. Uh, something that I found interesting with them is no one was allowed to spill the blood of a Vestal Virgin. So they came up with horrific punishments, including a very elaborate way to bury them alive when they messed up. Like they couldn't have sex. If they did, if I understand it correctly, it was a little like the way that they said it was weird. They weren't technically supposed to bury people in that area, I guess, or in the city. And so what they do is they'd make like this room and they'd give them enough provisions for a couple days. And so it was like, oh, they died on their own of natural causes in a room. This feels super fucked. It was weird. It was elaborate. It was fucked. And then like in one place, I saw that they thought they were connected to the gods. So then like if one of them made some sort of mistake and there were several different rules, but if one of them made a mistake, I don't know, like the fire burnt out or something, then they would be punished because they're like, you messed up. Or because they were so connected to the gods, if something catastrophic happened, they would go, well, which one of you messed up? What the fuck? We're, and we're going to talk about that that superstitious idea and like what culture has that in America? Fast forward in a few hundred years in this. But what I think is really interesting in that like in addition to the things that they couldn't do, they also had to have two living parents. Mm -hmm. And they had to be free of, quote, physical and mental defects. Yep. In addition to just being generally fucked up, it seems like it was ableist, classist, mm -hmm. all the ists. Like, it was every fucking ist. Very fascinating to me. And I also, like, I thought it was interesting, too, that they were chosen to do this between the ages of six and ten. Yeah, so they'd start at six, and then they would be like, they could make that decision around 36 if they wanted to stay put or if they wanted to go and get married. The idea that you were asking anyone to make any decision about any fucking part of their life at six, at six fucking years old is insane. Just the idea that like six years old, they're like, do you promise to not have sex for the next 30 years? And by the way, if you don't, we're going to fucking murder the fuck out of you. Mm -hmm. But we won't spill your blood, don't worry, because that's sacred. <laughs> don't worry not. And, like, we're going to presume that most six-year-olds are going to stay virgin for a little while. That's fair. You know, life expectancy was shorter then, but, like, six? I don't know. That's That's got me all fucked up. I thought it was interesting, too, that they would be, you know, the ones that chose to leave at 36, that's mm -hmm. when they'd get married and start having children. So it was like, 
you know, in order to become one, both your parents had to be alive. I guess they live a little while after 36, but it just seemed like it was later in life compared to like what you think of nowadays when people have children. I also love that they had like a very specific diet. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. They couldn't eat meat. They had to eat like fruits, vegetables and a dough that was fried in olive oil. And then the water, too. Yeah. Wasn't the normal water supply water. And they couldn't eat anything that touched a flame. Yeah, I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole just because the way that they tortured these poor women when they, you know, thought that they messed up in some fashion was horrible. Like, at one, I think one, they poured some sort of, like, molten liquid down their throats. The fuck? Like, just awful, awful stuff happened. So I went down a rabbit hole. I'm like, it kind of goes, you know, how they valued virgins. And I was like, oh, man, what is this? So back to why is being a virgin important to supernatural forces? Another one is that the blood would have much less risk of being infected with bloodborne diseases. Okay, I guess. Nowadays, they just go get a simple test. When I was looking this up, someone like made a joke too. like, nowadays, they just take them to the blood bank and like get a little test to make sure the blood was pure. They didn't even have to be a virgin anymore. <laughs> but some say also that when they said virgin blood, they didn't actually mean virginity, but that the blood was just never used in a ritual before. So they would go after like younger kids and babies and things like that because that would have been the safest option to know that their blood had not been used before. And also many cultures value a child's life more than adult life. So it was like, you know, more sacred again. So I knew this next one, but I didn't think of it in like the supernatural blood sense because why would I? But if the ritual or whatever, you know, vampire, witch, whatever trope you want to go with, needed a woman's blood, and that's all they wanted. They only needed a woman's blood. They had to make sure that the woman had never been pregnant before. So again, you can kind of guess that a young child or a virgin wouldn't have had, obviously, a baby before, right? And the reason is, when a woman has a son, after the baby is born, the mom still carries some of the child's DNA. So researchers have found that mothers of sons end up with male DNA deeply embedded in their brains. Fascinating. Yeah, I didn't know it till I was pregnant. And I read an article relating this to Max specifically in Hocus Pocus is hard. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that I saw that we could like kind of relate to Max is that a virgin probably doesn't have a lot of outside influence yet spiritually. So some say that they're more open to supernatural things or they can like do more because the outside influence hasn't told them not to. So what I think of is when we talked about kids remembering their past lives. Or like kids that see ghosts and they see them more frequently because they haven't been told over and over again that it's not real and that they can't believe that. Max was a little older, though, but I'm trying to tie it to Virgin Max. <laughs> well, there you have it. We're going to move fully away from that and we're going to talk about a little hocus pocus theory. As I told you, I recently rewatched the movie as part of our research. I was watching it and at one point, Allison surrounds herself with salt after reading about that being a way you can protect yourself from witches in their spell book, which is also known as the Manual of Witchcraft and Alchemy. And she's doing this like basically as Winnie is attacking her. And Winnie says, what a clever little white witch. Mm -hmm. And I went, ooh, is she a witch? And then I'm kind of like looking at her and I'm like, okay, throughout the movie, she's wearing very light colors. Except red. I don't know if you've seen all of the uh, outrage about her red coat lately, because everyone wants the red coat and they've made so many hocus pocus like lines of clothing recently but no one has made that damn coat yet and everyone wants it and speaking of the coat at one point you see the sanderson sisters put their hoods up right it's like it's like a thing that they do mm -hmm. and do you know who else does that with her red coat uh-huh allison does additionally allison's family runs the sanderson museum that's how they were able to get in there so that max could light the stupid fucking candle and <laughs> The house is eerily preserved inside. It's almost like it's preserved too well. You see all of their possessions as they left them. They know where everything is. Sarah walks in and immediately reaches up, grabs her signature lucky rat tail. And it's almost like it was taken care of by somebody who cared about them or a family that cared mm -hmm. about them. They kind of allude to the fact that her family has been there for a very long time. So some people think that they were a family of prominent witches and that they were awaiting the return of the Sanderson sisters. And that's one of the reasons they maintain that house so well. And at one point she says that she's into witches. Mm -hmm. Also, okay, 
they've possibly killed the Sanderson sisters. They didn't, but they think they did, right? They're back at Max and Danny's house. And as soon as Danny is asleep, just like barely just fell asleep, it seems like immediately Allison's like, how do I get this kid to open up this fucking book, right? And she's like, oh, it sucks about Binks. Bakery Binks, by the way. Mm -hmm. And it's so sad we can't help him. So she's like, we should open the book. And he's like, I don't know. And she's like, we should open the book. Like, she, like, clearly <laughs> wants to. So it seems like she's a little too weaker. Mm -hmm. Also, I didn't see this anywhere else, but I noticed it when I was watching it, was that she didn't interact with the salt herself. Like, she wasn't taking, like, a handful of it and throwing it. It was in, like, classic salt container, where it has a little, like, middle spout. Mm -hmm. She was taking that, flinging it around her and up into the air away from her, but it was never on her and she never touched it. I rewatched that scene today because I was like, huh, I never noticed that. And she does fling it, but she goes like up. You can't see my motion, but she goes up and it kind of lands in her hair and stuff, though. It looks looks like. Does it? It looks like she throws it straight up. Because to me, it looked like she was taking it and she was flinging it onto them, but it was like up and over. I don't know. Tell us what you think. Yeah. It wasn't careful, though. Like if she couldn't touch it and didn't want to be near it, I feel like the way that she flung it would have been a little more careful. That's fair, but she was also fairly covered, and it didn't kill them. It just seemed like they were adverse to it. Yeah. Also, she wears a necklace throughout the movie that, to me, kind of looks like a medallion kind of thing. It looks like an older necklace. I could be just reading into it. It could have been that the person who did the costumes was, like, talking about witches. Let's do an old necklace. She likes witches. Interesting, though. So, Hocus Pocus is set in Salem, Massachusetts. It's about witches who were hanged after they hurt children. It's very clearly... <laughs> derived from the Salem witch trials. So we're going to get to that now. And I was actually a little bit surprised because I think that I thought that they were much more gruesome than they were. They're fucked up. I think that I thought that they were more pervasive in the United States than they actually were. Obviously, colonial America at that point. I thought that it was more heinous than it was. And I was like, interesting. So the Salem witch trials, which are in Massachusetts, occurred between 1692 and 1693. And over 200 people were accused of witchcraft and around 20 were executed. And it's interesting too, and we'll talk about the end, but the families of those who were executed actually were compensated when everyone was like, fuck, this was wrong. And so at that time, Christians believed that Satan could give people, witches, power to hurt other people if they promised to be loyal to Satan. And this is kind of happening as the quote-unquote witchcraft craze is fizzling out in Europe. So in Europe, it started in the 1300s and it ended in the 1600s. As Mina mentioned earlier, the Witchcraft Act of 1604 deemed practicing witchcraft a felony in England. And if you were convicted of a minor offense of witchcraft, you were only in prison for a year. But if you were caught twice, you were executed. I like that they gave you a little warning. <laughs> like, we know you're a witch. Knock it off. And then fuck you, you're a witch. Yeah. Yeah. So in Europe, it's believed that roughly 110,000 people were tried for witchcraft. And then of that 110,000, 40 to 60,000 were executed. That is terrifying. Yes. Yes. And most of those who were executed were women. Mm -hmm. So, again, as I mentioned before, Salem's witch trials came as they were fizzling out in Europe. So in 1641, the Body of Liberties, which was the first legal code that was established in New England, was adopted by the General Court for the colony of Massachusetts Bay. And it included witchcraft as a capital offense, which means punishable by death. Mm -hmm. And it said, if any man or woman be a witch that is, hath, or consulteth with a familiar spirit, they shall be put to death. And then it basically quotes Bible passages from Exodus and Deuteronomy. Before the witch trials, it was very rare for a witch to be executed in colonial America. So witch trials started in 1690. This law was passed in 1640. So there's about almost 50 years of this being illegal, mm -hmm. where people are not being killed. And so in 1689, King William's War displaced people into what we call Salem today. At that time, it was colonial Salem town. There were already existing conflicts between powerful families. There was also distrust with the first ordained minister, Reverend Samuel Paris. We'll talk about his family in a moment. And because people thought he was strict and greedy, people thought that these conflicts and the war and the distrust were all work of the devil. And this really mirrors back to those 1300s and how 
things were just fucking awful and people needed someone to blame. They needed something that they could rally against and for there to be a reason that they were going through so much shit. I can understand why you would do that theoretically, mm -hmm. but the mental gymnastics that you would need to take in order for this to be a reasonable conclusion, it's mind blowing to me. Yeah. In addition to the idea that, like, it's the work of the devil, Puritans generally believed that when bad things happened, they were a consequence of a spiritual failing. So it's not just that, like, oh, you're a bad person. It's like you're spiritually bad. But so in January of 1692, Elizabeth Paris, who was nine, and Abigail Williams, who was 11, began having what are commonly described as fits. And what they were was bouts of screaming making odd sounds, throwing things, contorting their bodies, and they also said that they could feel like someone was biting or pinching them. And their doctor, William Griggs, said it was supernatural influences, and I think that's in part because he didn't really know what it was. He also may have been influenced by Cotton Mather's book, Memorable Providence, relating to witchcraft and possessions from 1869, and in that publication, he tells the story of children from Boston who had also had fits, and their fits sound shockingly similar to what these girls are experiencing and they were deemed to have been bewitched and just interestingly from what i read i saw that they were also aware of the idea of being bewitched and this behavior being symptoms of being bewitched mm -hmm. theoretically one could say that perhaps they weren't actually having any symptoms right they were just acting and so one of the neighbors of the girls had a suggestion that might help them very clearly, a urine cake is what would fix this. And so basically, they had their slave, Tituba, who we're going to talk about more, make a cake that had the girl's urine in it. And the idea is that it would help them find out who is bewitching them. And I, for the life of me, cannot put those together. What? Yeah. And also, I mean, just like practically, I have a lot of questions. What are you baking that in? Are you going to save that baking dish? Are you going to save the instrument you use? How bad must that have fucking smelled? What wet ingredients are you replacing with the urine? You know, like, I have a lot of practical questions about that, but anyway. Okay, Reverend Paris, who we mentioned a minute ago, was pissed about this because he was like, this is blasphemy. I don't care why you're doing it. It's blasphemy. I mean, I side with him there. I mean, yeah, I mean, just <laughs> not for the reasons he did, just because, ooh. Yeah. But, like, another kind of underlying thing here is Tichuba would play fortune-telling games with the girls. And that was definitely a Puritan no-no. And the girls would, like, teach their friends it. And, again, we talked about this in our Halloween episode a long time ago, that some of the practices that we have for Halloween derive from, like, quote-unquote fortune-telling games where a little girl will, like, throw an apple peel over her shoulder or do things like that. So it's, when you, I, we say fortune-telling games, we don't necessarily mean, like... Like crystal ball. From what I understand, more like throwing an apple peel or like these kind of like folk games. Who will you marry games and things like that. Yeah. Innocent, silly games. Yeah, exactly. So more girls began experiencing these same symptoms. By February, warrants were issued for the arrest of Tachuba, Sarah Good, and Sarah Osborne. Sarah Good was known for having a hot temper and she was described as a beggar. Sarah Osborne was an elderly woman who was bedridden. However, she was generally disliked because she had a relationship with an indentured servant. On March 1st, 1962, both Sarahs, as well as Tachuba, are questioned for three days. Both Sarahs said that they were innocent, but Sarah Good accused Sarah Osborne. The Sarahs were up to something. Also <laughs> another band name. Oh, the Sarahs were up to something? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that our band name? I can't play any <laughs> instruments, can you? Uh, a little. A little. Well, what can you play? Uh, I've played violin. I've played a little bit of drums. We're going to have I've a fucking rocking band. Fiddle. Keyboard. Drums. What else we got? Keyboard. We got Amanda on the... We got Amanda on the keys, the strings, the, the percussion. We've got Lindsay looking cool. The triangle. <laughs> Offbeat as fuck. Or cowbell, maybe? Ooh, cowbell. Yeah, I tried... Um, For a while, I tried bass, and I am not good at guitar or bass. Like, I am terrible. I also tried bass. I, ch like, I took lessons. Uh-huh. Uh, it wasn't until a solid decade after that I was like, oh, that's the bass guitar in a fucking song. Like, I don't... <laughs> I wanted to. I wanted to be the type of person who played instruments. Mm -hmm. I am not musically inclined. You know what I really want? To this day, I've been like, hmm, do I have enough room for it? Maybe when I move, I will. I want an electric cello. So bad. I mean, that would probably be fucking awesome. 
It is awesome, and I want it. Y'all know when, when Amanda gets that, because we'll obviously have to fucking redo our, like, theme song <laughs> with that. Yeah. One day. All right, back back to witch trial. It's heavy, so sometimes we got to go back and forth between something light, because it's difficult. Yeah, yeah. So, Tichuba told authorities that the evil came to be and begged her to serve him. She said she had visions of black dogs, red cats, yellow birds. Was it... Thick cat, thin bear, you know? Thick cat, thin bear, baby. So she also had visions of a dark man who wanted her to sign his book, which is actually like, when you think about it, that's actually pretty frightening. That is really frightening. It also gives me uh, Sabrina the Teenage Witch vibes. Mm -hmm. Not the Melissa Joan Hart one, the Netflix one. Both were a treasure of delight. Yeah, 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 yeah. The newer one. Mm -hmm. Tachuba said that she signed the book and saw both Sarah's names, as well as seven other names that she couldn't read. She also said that they wanted to destroy Puritans. Girl, same. Yeah. People started getting paranoid, and more people were then accused. Martha Corey was suspected as a witch. This really concerned people because she had been a member of the church. Sarah Good's daughter, Dorothy, who was just four years old, was questioned. And because she answered meekly, they said that that was a confession. I can't imagine a four-year-old answering any questions, like, coherently. In April, the deputy governor, Thomas Danforth, brought his assistance to the hearings. People from Salem and other villages in Massachusetts were also questioned. That May, Governor William Phipps ordered the creation of two special courts, one to hear and one to decide for Suffolk, Essex, and Middlesex counties. During the trials, the accused represented themselves. Not fair. Mm Mm-mm. Most accusers were under 20 years old. The tests to determine if someone was a witch were pretty much impossible to pass. So we're going to talk about those tests, obviously. So there's the incantation test. In that, the suspected witch would tell the devil to leave the victim. And if the victim was cured, then that was considered proof that the suspected person was a witch. And so the idea is like, say, I don't know, the cat was (laughs) suspected of being a witch because... Still jam. Amanda had started feeling like she was being pitched by a stranger and the cat was like devil get out of amanda and then if you stop feeling pinched then you then like the cat then was a witch what a highly corruptible test and all like most of the accusers were under 20 and you know children yeah yeah they also had the prayer test which basically meant that if the suspected witch made an error or like paused or hesitated when they were reciting the lord's prayer from memory they were a witch because it just remembered something fucking wrong the pricking test which oof, don't like this one at all so basically the person who was afflicted or persons would poke scratch sometimes do little cuts to the witch and if doing that cured the afflicted person then the accused was a witch if you had moles freckles birthmark scars or extra nipples that was considered proof of a contract with the devil that was known as a skin test. Okay. There was also the swimming test or dunking. I feel like this is the one that most people have heard of. Yeah, yeah. Where if you sunk to the bottom of a lake, you prove that you were human because they thought that witches would float. But you either were a witch or dead. And there's like no in between. They, they also had the touch test where the suspected witch would touch the person that they had bewitched. And if that person felt pain, then the accused was a witch. Are you noticing a pattern of the accuser having all of the power and there's no defense for this? Yeah. And like no logics either. Like the swimming test, people obviously, like if any of them jumped in, they were going to float. Mm hmm. So they also had the weight test. And what I love about this one is this is the one that was passable. But when they passed it, they were like, ah, oh, that's not right. We need to do another test. Because basically, they thought that witches were light. So like they weighed very little. And so they would weigh them against a Bible. And if they were lighter than the Bible, <laughs> then they weren't a witch. Most humans are going to be heavier than a Bible. So I feel like that was just bizarre. Mm -hmm. And then, look, we heard about urine cake earlier, but this is a witch cake test. And so what they would do is they would make a cake out of the witch's urine and then they would feed it to a dog. And if the dog had like any negative effects, then the person was a witch. And again, like I have the same like, honestly, procedural questions here. Like, are we throwing this pan away? Who's making this cake? Why are they doing this to dogs? Right. What did the dog do wrong? 
this is the only instance where it's not a human who gets to be like, oh, they hurt me. But in the same respect, like, it's very easy to be like, oh, that dog looked like it limped for a second or it twitched or, oh, it sat down. It was standing up. Oh, it was sitting. It stood up. It's equally subjective and strange to me. Right. And every dog, some are super sensitive to anything. Some can eat anything they want. I thought you were going to say some are super sensitive to urine cakes. And I was like, I mean, probably. I mean, ha think of it. Hallie could eat seven urine cakes and be fine. Yeah. Moo Kimber could might eat not like it. Five. <laughs> no, Moo's, Moo's got an iron stomach. She ate a whole host of fucking weird ass things. Well, yeah, Kimber. Kimber would definitely like die. Kimber's also like the size of a thimble. <laughs> Kimber's my one-eyed, blind, geriatric dog, for context. And when she barks, she sounds like a dog who is a mile away barking. <laughs> Even it's though like you're one right of those next toy to dogs. It's like, wah, wah, wah. Yeah. Wah. Like, it sounds like an echo of a dog that's really far away. And to the point where I was like, wait, is that a dog that's near me? Why are hearing this? Because we were in Amanda's house. But anywho, let's get back to witch trials. <laughs> I mean, everyone should hear about Kimber at one point. Always. <laughs> so those who confessed were afforded some leniency because the Puritans believed that God would punish them. Silly. Typical God. Typical God. So the first case was of Bridget Bishop. She was an older girl who was known for promiscuous gossip. She had been tried for witchcraft 12 years earlier and had been acquitted. But then they're like, mm-mm. When asked if she had committed witchcraft, Bishop said, quote, I am as innocent as a child unborn. Amanda, I'm going to need better acting. I'm going to need it. <gasps> I am as innocent as a child unborn. <laughs> you you even like grasped your pearls there. I did. I, did. I clutched my <laughs> chest. <gasps> you know, the gasp. I, it, it goes along with it. It's part of the gasp action. Or just, I, I just feel like that just feels like a very dramatic statement. Anywho. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm sorry. For my critiques. I didn't realize I was a voice actor right now. Yeah. Okay. It's all we have is our voices. We must carry this. <laughs> I feel like I need like an accent or something then to do this right. Can you do an old time? No, I can't do an accent. All I can do is a bad Boston accent and never on purpose. <laughs> I think of when you messaged me not too long ago and I just <laughs> took it as, yep, I thought she was Boston again and she wasn't. She actually meant a different word, but. <laughs> no, I misspelled the word smart, which the irony is not lost on me, but it was S-M-A-T and she read it as smart. <laughs> and that is not the accent that these women had. No. To my knowledge. I feel like, you know, old time ear. Old time ears. Yeah, the proper uh, term, I think. For sure, Zace, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, old so. Old time ear scientist. Bridget Bishop, she was found guilty. And on June 10th, she was the first person hanged. So sad, especially because like the 12 years earlier, she was acquitted. And then they're like, mm, let's get back to you. So the area that she was hanged later became known as Gallows Hill. I'm sure everyone's heard of that. Cotton Mather wrote the court five days later, asking them to allow testimony about visions and dreams, which he called spectral evidence. And did we not just talk about that in a more recent case? Yeah, we did. We did. Right? When somebody basically confessed, being like, but I saw it from the treetops. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What's interesting, too, is, like, in different sources, I see people say, like, spectral evidence in, like, those dreams and visions. But I also see where people say specter evidence, where they mean, like, people are, like, pinch, like, like a ghost, like an, a living person's apparition is attacking someone in that astral projection kind of way. Hmm. Sorry, I just realized you're about to say something different. Yeah, I always find all of the astral projection stuff fascinating because I've seen so many ghost stories surrounding it. And I'm like invested. Whenever that comes up, I'm like, tell me everything. So real quick, I'm going to insert this here. If you have an astral projection story that's a little creepy, please tell us about it because we have our listener stories podiversary episode coming up. And those are one of my favorite stories. Also, if it's not scary, I, we still want to hear about it. <laughs> Yes, I'm fascinated. Please. You insert whatever adjective in front of story you need to. We want to know about it. We do. Absolutely do. Phipps replaced the court with the Superior Court of Judicature, which did not allow specter evidence after his own wife, Mary, was accused. Of course. Like, oh, this gets to you. So now it's like, no, 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 no. That's not allowed. Yeah. The court only condemned three of 56 defendants, but still, like, that's really sad. All who were imprisoned for witchcraft charges were pardoned. So by then, 
19 had been hanged. And Giles Corey, who was a 71-year-old man, had been stoned. But not in the sense of like, I think Handmaid's Tale now, stoning. It was like the press to death stoning, where they'd put something on top of them and then put heavy things on top over and over and over until they were, you know, squished to death. And then some of the accused had died in jail. So interestingly, none were burned at the stake, but they were in Europe. Nowadays, we see that more often, like the witches were burned at the stake. I think of American Horror Story. But when we were researching this, like I obviously we we all have learned about the witch trials in school, but I didn't really know a lot about the European witch trials, which were like super gruesome. Yeah, yeah. Intense. And I was like, oh, my goodness. I wish I would have learned about this, too. On January 14th, 1697, General Court ordered that there be a day of fasting and soul searching. So in 1702, the court declared the trials had been unlawful. In 1711, a bill restoring the rights and good names of those accused was passed. 600 pounds restitution was given to their heirs, which, like, that doesn't replace anyone. No. But at least, like, their names were cleared, but, like, that still doesn't bring them back. In 1957, Salem officially apologized. I like that they, like, gave him money and then they're like, now we're, now we're sorry about it. <laughs> so what did happen then? In 1976, Linda Caporeal published an article in Science suggesting the fits that people were experiencing were due to ergot poisoning. Ergot is a fungus that can be found on wheat and rye, as well as other plants. And symptoms of it are muscle spasms, delusions, hallucinations, vomiting, feeling like something is crawling on your skin, and choking, which is crazy, right? Mm -hmm. like, that's what all of them were doing. So LSD is a derivative of ergot. And so I, I don't know why I think of this. What comes to mind is when we were talking about MK Ultra. Oh, that's also what came to my mind was that like, because you say LSD, I say MK Ultra. Like, I can't not, right? <laughs> when I was uh, researching last night, I got into a tangent about MK Ultra and, of course, Operation Midnight Climax. Always. And Mike's just looking at me like, what is wrong with you? Why do you know this stuff? Well, you'd know if you'd listened to my show. You're welcome. But yeah. So there were lots of other phenomena that had attributed to ergot poisoning, but we aren't going to get into them today. But it's just fascinating that like something that was, I would think, like fairly easy to contract is what they finally figured out what was going on. Yeah, there's a few different things. Like we have a list. It's, it's kind of fascinating to think like how often are we like, oh, there's like a moral failing and we've got magic when it's like, nah, y'all are on LSD. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I just find that interesting. It makes sense. And I just want to point out too that Moo is just like under <laughs> Lindsay's arm, like, please pet me. Notice me. Notice me, mom, please. I'm dying. You might hear her whining right now. Oh, and she wagging her not. tail. I can hear the tail wag hitting something. Do but it tail wag. It's all right. That's the know. added bonus content for making You're it welcome. to the end. Oh my gosh, Moo. Two paws over here. So, do you feel like you know more about Hocus Pocus? Do you feel like you know more about our ideas on witches and virginity? Uh, <laughs> we've, we've talked about so much today. But I think that one of the interesting things about this is that, like, we I'd heard about Salem Witch Trials, you heard about a lot of the tropes, and kind of putting it all together and kind of thinking about the history behind the movie. A fun time. I was, like, watching the movie and I was like, I want to know about this, and I want to know about this, and I want to know about this, and I'm sorry, you might hear Moo licking my arm in the background of that. I can't help it. She loves <laughs> me. She wants me to be done recording. But I didn't realize that there had been a Hocus Pocus sequel book. Neither did I. And... I was like, oh, and I watched a couple of videos about it because I didn't have time to read the book. And I was like, oh, interesting. There were characters I'd never thought about, history I'd never considered. But all of this, I'm pretty sure would be a spoiler. So we didn't include it in the episode because we don't want to ruin it for you, honestly, or ourselves, because we're fucking hyped. We're assuming you're hyped if you stayed around this long. Amanda, what are you doing to celebrate the Hocus Pocus release? So the day of the release, I'm actually going to be really sad and stay away from TV and social media and everything because I'm not watching it till the day after because I'm going to a Hocus Pocus release party. I love this for you. I love this journey for you. I'm so excited. I'm excited. And Nora, one of our listeners, is throwing it and it's going to be so exciting. I can't wait to make treats and talk about Hocus Pocus all night long. What about you? I'm very jealous. I have sent my husband a calendar invite for- <laughs> Did that before Hocus we recorded? Pocus. Yes, I was like, I'm sending him a calendar invite right now. Hocus Pocus 2. 
Prepare for pajamas at 7.45 p.m. I'm going to be very upset if he wasn't already, like, having that in his head that that was Hocus Pocus night. I don't think he did. This is the fucking stuff. Mm -hmm. And speaking about the fucking stuff, we have a new contest coming up. We are curating a very fun, spooky box. It's going to be about a $100 value. And the way you enter is by leaving us a review and or by recommending someone to listen to the show and they leave a review and they let us know it's you who sent them. We're going to aggregate data with a Google form. It's going to be in our show notes. It's way easier that way. So if you'd like to enter, check out our show notes. So it's there. We'll also have it on our website, on our social media, all the things. But it helps the show grow. Spooky season is coming. So we want to we want to bring more. It's here. A spooky season is here. Okay, it's always you. here to us. But official spooky season of October 1st for people who don't prescribe to all year. Ugh. And we want to draw all of the creepies to us. Yes. Yes. And with that, have a great weekend. Thanks for creeping with us. Thanks for listening. And as always, a special thank you to our patrons who support us via Patreon. Please see the link in our show notes to learn more about how you, yes you, can begin to haunt the dump guard vortexes or even become a scorching sasquatch Ooh. also in our show notes you can find the link to our website more information on our sources our social media handles and our merch store we'd love for you to keep creeping with us so if you like this episode please subscribe rate review and share the show with your fellow creeps and or ghosts i beg of you <laughs>
Yeah, yeah. The echo. You'd have to add a lot of cloth surfaces. I've said it several times. Like, my friend growing up lived in a funeral home. Like, her home was attached to a funeral home. So it doesn't bother me as much. I know when I was younger, I was like, when I was alone there, it was a little scary. But, you know, it happened. It's fine. In fact, we need to do a poll. It's not a fact. Because you know what? We're going to... Me and all of society will tell you that raisin cookies are a disappointment. Here's my question. Are you thinking it's a chocolate chip cookie and then you're like, oh, it's raisin? Or are you like looking at it like that's a raisin cookie? I don't want that. Both. Like a situation anytime where I'm like, this baked good is this thing and it's not that I'm sad. It doesn't have anything to do with it being a raisin cookie. And look, if you haven't had the right oatmeal raisin cookie, then maybe you just don't know. You know what? My mother-in-law makes amazing ones. They're so good. We don't even allow raisins into this house. It's a raisin-free home. <laughs> it is. Because because I have a young child and dogs. And they're disgusting. I also forgot Hallie literally tries to fucking eat everything. I've never met anyone with a menagerie of pets <laughs> more trying to just end their lives than your animals. Like, they're like, what can we do yeah. to stress you the fuck out? Yep. Yep. That's what we want to do. You're such a good animal mom. For context, we take the dogs and cats and things that like no one wanted. So that's why they're just I would have misfit toys. A mess. <laughs> they are. Not Toby. Toby's a perfect angel dog. But that's the only dog I've ever chosen in my entire life. That's fair. So <laughs> that's why he's perfect. Yeah. Let me paint you a picture, dear listener. Okay. You know, I'm going to start from the bottom. The bag. So, no, no, not the bag. That's, that's the center part of the story. Okay, first off, the bottom has, it's like kind of ornate and it goes in between what looks like, is it Baphomet? Maybe, it could be. A goat and baby heads and then what looks like <laughs> always fucking maple leaves. And there's like kind of like a filigree design. And if you're like, what the fuck are you talking about? I need you to know that I'm also like, what the fuck am I talking about? But it is baby heads and goat heads and maple leaves. And I'm sorry, that's just what it is. Then he's got cute little, cute little, like a uh, little, some flats. Booties, yeah. With green leggings, as one does, with a red robe that I can't tell if he has a white shirt underneath or if that's his hairless <laughs> chest. It could be either. It's really Christmassy, though. It, like, connects at the top and it's blue because there's, like, a, a light blue lapel. But, yes, it is a Christmas red and green is the only way I could describe it. And, of course, he's got a different color sleeve. It's, like, a dirty white, maybe, and or, like, a cream color that is also dirty with, like, the bottom of his sleeve is red. I don't know why his outfit's really important, but it is. He also has, obviously, a sack of children. We're going to start with the sack and we're going to move the way up. In this sack, there's like one kid that looks like they're sitting up and then one that looks like they're like laying to the side, which means that they would be stepped on by the other one. And they're just chilling. They look horrified. The one that's stepped on doesn't look like it's doing well. The one that's standing up just looks like it's seen some things. Then, because we ha there's not enough here, in his left arm, he's holding a baby who has cute little arm chubby rolls but is like holding on to him and it has his arm on its head like it's posing but not in horror but like oh look at me that's the look on its face to me it's not like terror it's oh look at me and then of course in his right hand he's eating a baby full on like yep not like a piece of a baby like a whole baby is going into his mouth and he's like, like, uh, I would say belly button up is presumably already in his mouth and or has been swallowed because you see a little baby butt and baby feet and chunky little thighs. And I've got like so many questions because the first one is, is that he is relatively human sized and humans can't fit babies into their mouth. So, and like, I think the baby that he's eating looks kind of smaller than the other babies. I don't know. I mean, like, I guess of all the questions I have, it's that how is... He looks human-sized. How's he eating babies? Can he, like, open his mouth like a snake? I don't know. It kind of does look like he's swallowing them whole. But I guess I'm just an old hag now, apparently. <laughs> and I need to bathe in the blood of teens. Children. <laughs> Am I going to interrupt a thousand times? Yes. One of my favorite, like, witchy movies is Practical Magic. I think that's everyone's. One of everyone's. Yeah, because if you've got good taste, look, we're there. However, did you know that it's based on a book? It's based on um, a series of books that was written by Alice Hoffman. 
So she had basically practical magic. Then she wrote a prequel. And she wrote like a prequel to that prequel. And it has the main character fleeing Europe and coming to colonial America during this time. And at one point, she has a daughter who is young and her daughter is questioned in relation to her being a witch. Oh, wow. Okay. And it's like really an interesting kind of like parallel. But if you want to hysterically cry, just read Alice Hoffman's books. It's very cathartic. Anywho, back to this. <laughs> so back. I can't look. I can't help it. But I also just need you to know that my favorite genre of movies, books, television shows is witches and magic. As we were finishing up, I was like, if there's witches in it, I'm there. I'm there. Of course, there's the Beautiful Creature series. There's the Poison Study series. There's the Discovery of Witches. There's all of Alice Hoffman's books. There's Garden Spells, which is amazing. If you haven't read that, go read that. There's an endless amount of books that I have like that are about magic. And that's all I ever want to read. I listed those in like the span of a minute. And I was like, <laughs> what other books? Because like, I kind of don't read a book unless there's magic in it. Actually, you know what? It's fall. We're here. Go read Night Circus. And when you do it, before you do, buy some apple cider, buy some caramel popcorn. You're going to want it. The way that they describe it is just so amazing. Amanda, do you feel similarly about witch content? <laughs> I do. I do. And like, when you were talking about like practical magic and the like the old witch movies too, I grew up on those. Like that's what I was yeah. watching and yeah, for sure. I feel like practical magic has such like a nostalgic feeling in me because I remember the wonder that I felt the first time I watched it. And I feel that way every time I watch it. Because, I mean, it came out in 1998, so it was 11. And I just feel like 11-year-old me was like 10 out of 10. Barbara? Raisin cookies are disgusting. They're delicious. 